All right, folks, we are back for the second installment of the Muscle and Strength Training Pyramid, where we are organizing training into a logical priority system to help you reach your goals. Much like the nutritional pyramid that I made a couple of years back, uh, we have a system where we have a pyramid based on priorities, where just like in architecture, the bottom is the foundation, the most important, and as we move to the top, it becomes the least important. We're on episode two today, after we covered the adherence, the most important part last week, volume, intensity, and frequency. This is going to be probably the longest episode because these are three very important topics that are inextricably linked. I didn't feel comfortable making them different levels because in the different contexts, any one of those can be more important than the other. Um, and they affect one another. So, we're doing them together. And it's going to be a long video and you're just going to have to like it. All right. So, as a reminder, the whole pyramid is encompassed by periodization because we use periodization to manage all of these things, all right? So, volume, intensity, and frequency, or VIF. VIF gets a double underline for being in interdependent. That is because if I was to increase my load or my intensity, that would actually increase my volume if I didn't change the other characteristics, right? If I did 3 by 3 at 100, that is 900 volume. If I increased it to 110, it would be that much more, because I can't do math in my head. So that would be 990. Okay, I could do it. Awesome. 9 reps times 100 and 9 reps times 110. All I did was increase the load, but the volume went up, right? Likewise, if I add a day of training, I think I've just increased my frequency. Well, guess what? If I don't change the current days of training I have, I've also just increased my volume a whole lot. Also, if I increase the intensity of my program, that's going to affect my ability to recover and produce force again in subsequent days, so my volume might come down. Or I might have to do additional frequency to accommodate a higher volume program, or this or that, etc. So, you can have a high volume, high intensity, or high frequency program that could be quote unquote optimal, but it would need to be balanced with the other factors. So, therefore, it is not appropriate, in my opinion, to put any single one of these on a pedestal because in a different context, each one of them could be more important or less important than another. So, we're going to start with intensity. So let's get into it. This is the muscle and strength pyramid. So we're going to talk about both strength and hypertrophy. First thing we need to think about is specificity. So specificity means that to get a certain outcome in training, you need to train for it. A power lifter does low reps and heavy loads because in competition, he has to do a one rep max. All right? Strength is not just a quality of the body, but it is a skill, meaning that you need to get better at the movement which you want to be stronger at. Additionally, strength is not only affected by muscle size, which does have a large impact on strength, larger cross-sectional area, more mass, more muscle to contract, you can move heavier loads. However, it is the neurological system that's going to dictate a large amount of your strength gains. And that means you need specificity for the velocity and the load and the recruitment patterns that you need to use to move those heavy loads. So, meaning, Strength is optimized by specificity. Less specificity is needed for hypertrophy. This was shown quite well in a study by Schoenfeld back in the day, where he took two groups, equated volume, all right, so we're pretty much just able to look at intensity here. One group did all their training with three rep maxes. The other group did all their training with ten rep maxes. Equal amount of muscle growth, okay? Showing that specificity for hypertrophy has a pretty broad range. However, the 3 rep max group got stronger than the 10 rep max group, showing that if you want to get really good at lifting heavy things, you have to lift heavy things. However, muscle growth is not a specific adaptation outcome. Rather, that is just a quality of the body. So that needs loading on the muscle. So, specificity for strength. Developing a skill, developing the neuromuscular system. For hypertrophy, we simply need to load the muscle in a progressive way. Does that mean intensity is not important for hypertrophy? No, it is important. However, we have a broader range we can work with. It still needs to be heavy enough to optimize hypertrophy. Okay? If you think about it, we're all under load all the time because we're on Earth. That means that our muscles have to resist gravity in order to ambulate and move around. So clearly, if intensity was not important at all for hypertrophy, we would all be the same or the same level of development relative to our genetics just from being on planet Earth. 
Likewise, no matter how many reps I do with a pencil, I'm not going to be able to get the same growth as if I could with a 20 or a 40 pound weight. So there is some threshold somewhere. And where that threshold is is going to be dictated by a lot of other things, whether you're training to failure, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what we, what we do know is that when we're working with loads, say, 20 rep max and higher, if you equate volume to moderate and high rep, or, or sorry, uh, to moderate and high load, you're not going to get the same amount of growth. This was shown by Campos in 2002. You'll notice I've got little annotations all over this. There's going to be a bunch of references in my comments beneath uh, so make sure you check those. All right. So we know from Campos that high reps, when you equate volume, is not as effective to produce a hypertrophy as moderate and high, which are about equal. Okay. What we also know from a recent study by Schoenfeld as well is that if you were to equate vol or, or if you if you are doing uh, one group doing 20 to 35 rep max sets and the other group is doing the 8 to 12. If this group does two to three times as much volume, they get about the same amount of growth as a group that's doing, well, sorry, uh, a third or half. So to get the same amount of growth when using moderate loads, you have to almost double or triple that volume with high reps. And when you equate volume, you tend to get less growth. So you need to be heavy enough for hypertrophy. All right? So. This is because of effective reps. If you think about it, if I was to take that pencil to failure, it would only be the last few reps where I was actually training the muscle fibers to a point where they might have to adapt. And that means getting bigger, right? Or at least part of the adaptation is that. If you want to learn more about effective reps, there's a really cool system called MyoReps that was developed by Borge Fajerli. Um, and I've got a link to that below, which is effectively just talking about a system whereby you ensure that more of your reps are effective. I'm not necessarily advocating this, although it's a great program, but it's just something you can read about to learn more about the concept of effective reps. All right, moving on. So how do we measure intensity or load? Lots of ways to do it. Uh, one of the very common ones is percentage of one rep max. That means based on an estimated one rep max from an AMRAP, as many reps as possible, or an actual one rep max, you then prescribe loads based on a percentage. Say, I'm going to do five reps with 80% of my one RM. The downsides to this system is that it's not appropriate to do a one rep max on all movements, like a bicep curl, for example, or a lateral raise. Uh, additionally, if you're doing high rep training, that is going to be very dissimilar to a one rep max, meaning that some people are able to do eight reps at 80% of their one rep max, and other people would have to use 70% of their one rep max. So you need to know specifically where you fall along that spectrum. Um, the other options are using a rep max. This is a little more useful for a bodybuilder. For example, if you know your five rep max, you can say, hey, I'm going to do sets of six with my five rep max. That will keep me one repetition from failure, probably until my third or fourth set. So you can use rep maxes if you aren't someone who wants to do one RMs or estimate their one RMs, because if an estimated one rep max and you're doing high reps, it's a little bit different. So you could do a five rep max and a 10 rep max and a three rep max, and then use those as training guidance. Or you can use what's called an RPE. And when you use RPE for resistance training, I recommend that that RPE be based on repetitions in reserve, meaning how many reps left could I have done if I'd taken the set to failure. This is a system popularized and developed for resistance training by Michael Tuscher. Lots of good in information there. I would recommend you Googling his stuff and checking out React training systems. So this is, this is whereby uh, you simply do your sets and you choose how close to failure you want to get. A 10 RPE would be at failure, a 9 would be one rep, one rep left, and 8 would be 2. That's another way to measure intensity. So, some of you are probably wondering, well, why would I ever not want to go to failure? But doesn't failure increase the amount of muscle activation I get and ensure that I've trained the fiber completely? Those things are true. However, failure can cause you issues when you get to volume, which we'll talk about in the next section. If you were to do three sets of bench, at, with your five rep max load, and on your first set you maxed out and did, five, and, and did all five reps, you would probably drop down maybe three, maybe two reps on your next two sets, depending on your rest interval. However, if you were to stop and just do four, you might be able to maintain four reps for all three sets, or maybe four, four, three. So even a worst case scenario, you've done 11 reps, while the other guy has only done nine. So you can, get, you can hurt the amount of volume you can do by going to failure too frequently. So should we never use failure? No. It just needs to be done intelligently. So, have it be for a purpose. If you're going to be one at max testing, obviously you're going to failure. 
if you're going to do an AMRAP, as many reps as possible, obviously you're going to failure. But the purpose there is to actually figure out what is your max. Also, doing, going to failure on a squat and a lateral raise are very different things. So you could effectively probably go to failure on your isolation movements after your compound lifts and be able to get some extra stimulation. Or, if you know that you're training a muscle group with three different exercises, you could take the, that last exercise's last set to failure just to get a little eek out of, your, out of your training. But the point being is it needs to have a logical reason behind it and fit in with your, with your training progression. If you have an intended light week, or what people call a deload in your periodization, you probably wouldn't want to go to failure at all just to ensure that that week does its job of allowing you recovery before the next hard training block. So, failure with a purpose if you're going to use it. So given all of this, what are our conclusions? Well, we know that hypertrophy doesn't require as specific of a repetition range as optimizing muscle strength. So I would recommend about three-fourths of your volume be done in the 6 to 12 rep max range where you can effectively develop volume, right? And I'll talk about why the 6 to 12 rep max range is very good for generating volume. The other fourth, yeah, there's probably a rationale to do some heavy training and some higher rep training. There's an argument that higher rep training might be a better way to train slow twitch fibers. We haven't experimentally shown this to be superior for hypertrophy, but if your goal is to maximally hypertrophy all muscles, it doesn't matter whether it's slow twitch or, or fast twitch, not a bad idea to include some light training in there. Uh, some people might also say that it's better for connective tissue health, gives you a, a, a break and still gives, gives you a training stimulus. So certainly an argument to train in that 12 to 15 rep max range as well sometimes. As far as the heavy work, why would you do that? You're not a power lifter. Well, remember, the progressive overload is something that's extremely important. And it is encompassed within volume, intensity, and frequency. If you organize your volume and intensity and frequency appropriately, you will get progressive overload over time. And you will not adapt if you don't have progressive overload. We'll talk about that more in progression. But notice I said progression, not progressive overload, because I actually consider that something that's a piece of all of this. Because you can progressively overload lots of things. And that should be included in this discussion of BIF. So, for long-term progress, we need progressive overload. That means having some, some focus on strength over time makes sense to ensure that we're using higher volume. Remember, if you lift heavier weight, that's more volume, and provide higher levels of muscle tension over time. And there is some theoretical uh, evidence out there that perhaps the more experienced you get, the more important that could become, and that some heavy, heavier loading is more important for an experienced athlete. So the point being, there's reason to use both low reps and relatively high reps for hypertrophy, but most of the time you should be in that moderate rep range. So for strength, does that mean that all of our volume should be as heavy as possible? Because we know that muscle can move uh, weight better when it's bigger, so we want to get enough volume to grow. However, we also know we're trying to develop a skill, so therefore, all of our volume should be as heavy as possible. Uh, we should be only doing singles, doubles, or triples, or something like that. I would say that that is actually not the most effective way to gain strength, and here's why. In that same study that Schoenfeld did, comparing threes to tens, the, groups doing the, the group doing the three rep max loads, not only did they take four times as long to complete the study because they had to rest longer, but they also experienced more joint pain and had more dropouts and expressed more mental, mental burnout. So lifting heavy all the time means that all of your volume, if you're comparing it to an equated volume moderate rep program, is at a higher intensity. So the relative intensity of the workout is a lot higher, even though the volume is the same. So that's something you have to consider. Joint stress, time efficiency, and ability to recover. And this has also been shown in a very interesting study uh, by Badillo in 2006. Three groups of weightlifters, well-trained weightlifters at the national level. One group did, I believe, 40, let me get this wrong. 46 of, of, of their repetitions over a 10-week period in the 90% of one rep, one, uh, one rep max range or higher. Uh, another group did, it, did 92 reps, and the last group did about 186. So basically, each group doubled the, the other group's uh, total amount of, of volume over 90% of one rep max. Uh, what this equates to over roughly that 10-week period is that uh, four reps per week in, in the low-intensity group were performed over 90% per week, 8 to 9 in the moderate intensity group, and uh, 18 to 20 in the high intensity group. Okay, So a lot of maxing in that high intensity group. And guess what? 
the moderate intensity group actually increased their strength the most on the squat, snatch, and the clean and jerk. Why? Well, remember, strength is also a skill. And if you are constantly training so close to failure, you guys have all seen lifters train to failure on a regular basis. They don't always look pretty. And even highly skilled lifters who are very good at one rep maxes, that's why they're a highly skilled lifter, can't always perform at such a high intensity and so close to their max without form breaking down, or at the very least, experiencing a lot of mental fatigue, joint pain, and it's simply being an inefficient way to accumulate volume. So here's a practical recommendation based on that, since we know we can't do all of our work heavy and optimize strength. How about three-fourths of your work, if your main goal is strength, happens in that one to six RM range, and then that other fourth in the higher rep ranges for hypertrophy. That's probably a really good way to do it, and uh, both allowing you to get the muscle growth side of it and practice the skill without getting burnout. All right, let's talk about volume. All right, so we talked about intensity, and almost by default, I was forced to talk about volume, just kind of emphasizing the fact that these are all inextricably linked. So volume is basically the total work performed, all right? Remember that strength is developed through skill acquisition, neurological adaptation, motor units getting more effective at recruiting fibers, uh, you getting less inhibited, and basically having all the abilities to make your muscles move heavy loads and to get all of your other tissues of the body uh, acclimated to, to, to it as well. So skill acquisition, neurological adaptation, and morphological adaptation, or just simply hypertrophy, uh, are all the things that go into strength. So that means that Volume is very important because it's not just the amount of work you do, but it's also the amount of practice you get. Because remember that strength is always specific to a movement in a rep range. So the more time you get moving the loads with a specific exercise in a specific rep range, the better you will get at being stronger. Okay? So hypertrophy really is just related to the total work performed and is less specific, as we already talked about, to the intensity range or the movement performed. You can make your legs grow on various pieces of equipment. Uh, you can also get stronger on various pieces of equipment, but the strength sticks prime, it mostly sticks between the movements. There's less transfer the more you get away from movement. We'll talk about that more in exercise selection. But hypertrophy, less about skill acquisition and neurological adaptation. Strength, much more. In fact, hypertrophy is a part of the reason why you get stronger. Okay? So, now, looking at studies with matched intensities or matched frequencies, we have found that strength and hypertrophy have a linear relationship to a point with volume. And it's not exactly linear. It does actually start to plateau off. So if you check out the references below, we've got a bunch of studies showing that multiple sets is superior to one set for enhancing strength and hypertrophy. But at a certain point, you basically run into um, getting less bang for your buck. Okay, you have to do more work to get a smaller increase. So this comes back to the concept developed in 1982 uh, of the fitness fatigue model. And this was developed by uh, Bannister, I believe. I knocked you all down, you all died. So as I was saying, the two-factor model of fitness and fatigue, I swear this is going to be better. All right. Two-factor model, fitness and fatigue. Basically, that when you train, it does two things. It develops fitness and it develops fatigue. One will mask the other and prevent you from being as fit. If you think about it, if you can currently max 100 kg and you do 100 kg and then you do 5x5 five five with 80 and then you go run a mile, if you come back, you probably won't be able to max 100 kg anymore. It looks like you're now less fit. That's fatigue, okay? Fatigue being a more general concept that relates to all aspects of the body, uh, both physiological, metabolic, and mental, and psychological, okay? So that means that as you train, you develop both fitness and fatigue. And at a certain point, fatigue will surpass your fitness, and you won't be able to train as hard or as heavy. This can be classified as overreaching, to where you know that your performance is going down, but if you just let that fatigue dissipate, it'll come back, and maybe more than it would if you hadn't overreached, maybe. Uh, or actually classified as overtraining, 
where your fatigue has gotten so high that it's prevented you from doing uh, any kind of optimal training or even good training to the point where fatigue and fitness were growing together and overreaching, but in overtraining, fatigue is growing, fitness growing, and then you don't stop, and now fitness and fatigue get even farther apart, so you have to wait forever for that fatigue to dissipate. Again, fatigue being psychological, physiological, metabolic, the whole nine yards. All right? So, certainly, you can do too much. More is not always better. And we actually have evidence for this. It's not just me saying that. All right? We just talked about Bedillo, right, in the intensity section, showing that the group that did the most amount of their volume with the highest intensity, more volume over 90% than the group the moderate or the light group, did not produce the best results as far as strength. It was actually the moderate group. So fatigue management is a very important part when you consider your volume, right? Uh, now, is it possible that you could use this uh, many, many reps at a high intensity successfully? Certainly the Bulgarian weightlifting team squad has. Certainly many people have, have, have been successful with that, but they have to manipulate the other aspects of frequency and intensity and they have to also acclimate to it. Uh, and they don't actually know if that would have been better than a more moderate approach. We would need a study on that, right? And we kind of have one. So, Bedillo has shown that going heavy all the time and making all your volume super heavy is, an, is actually less effective than doing a more moderate approach for strength. And then there's Wernbaum. In 2007, there was a uh, systematic review uh, that figured out basically the dose-response relationship for volume, intensity, and frequency in a certain category of studies, predominantly in novice and intermediate lifters, uh, for growth in the quad and the bicep, okay? And right around 40 reps per body part per session was about where the growth curve plateaued. And going above that, depending on the muscle group, uh, either plateaued or actually slightly declined. So you started to see a reduction in the amount of hypertrophy seen with a higher workload. Uh, again, it's difficult to, to say like, hey, if we'd taken all those studies and manipulated, you know, intensity and frequency would have that been different. But the point being is that too much volume for either hypertrophy or strength can start to go the other way. And that is probably because of the fitness and fatigue model. All right? If fatigue gets out of control, you have to figure out some way uh, to manage that and to therefore express the fitness and see the gains, all right? Easy, simple way of expressing this that's almost impossible to argue with, tapering. This has been consistently shown to be a method to improve performance. In all sports, when you have a, a pre-planned date that you know you're going to compete on, you're not competing every weekend like in team sports, but say endurance athletes, track and field, uh, strength and power athletes, all of them taper and drop volume to therefore perform better. They're managing the fatigue aspects so that they can perform better. So doing high volume all the time is not going to result in optimal performance, right? And if you need to train at a high intensity to get stronger, you need to be able to express that. And your job is not to constantly be expressing it in training, but you need to do it enough to improve that skill. So you can't have fatigue getting in the way. So you need to find some way to find the appropriate amount of volume to improve. The maximum amount of volume you can, you can perform is not necessarily the optimal volume for you to improve. It's all about fatigue management, periodization, and figuring out a way to do all of this. Now, it is true that over your career, volume should do this. The difference between making someone progress from beginner to intermediate to advanced is going to be an increase in volume. That'll happen from them getting stronger naturally, but it's also going to mean that they'll need to do higher levels of practice to get the higher levels of skill and that the closer they get to their genetic ceiling, they have to work harder to achieve less. And a big part of that is volume. So yes, yeah, sometimes if you're plateaued and you don't know how to progress and you've tried other things, when in doubt, do more. An easy way to think of it is, am I stalled? If yes, two options. Am I well recovered? If yes, add more volume. If no, if I'm under recovered, maybe temporarily reduce volume. If that improves my performance, great. If I stall again very quickly, it probably means I need more than a deload or a taper. I actually need to try doing less volume. In fact, a good way to think about it over your career is to do enough volume to progress and only increase when you need to do more, rather than constantly putting yourself in the hole with fatigue and having to, to drop your volume back and back and taper and deload all the time. All right? So, yes, 
volume should do this over your career, but you can do too much, and it needs to be managed, and you don't want to try to increase volume every single workout. Remember, this is long-term stuff, 3D muscle journey, not 3D muscle tomorrow, all right? It's going to take time, it's going to take commitment, it's going to take adherence, and you have to be able to manage your fatigue to do that. All right, let's stop there and go to frequency. All right, and lastly, we are going to talk about frequency. So, frequency is what organizes your volume and intensity, okay? Basically, this means that if you were to do all of your training for the week in one session, even if you equated the volume and equated the intensity, the same exact program, just done on one massive day versus doing it over six days, they would not be the same, okay? This is one of those contexts where you could say that frequency is more important than volume and intensity. Of course, that's not true. I could create a scenario where any one of these three things would be more important than the other two, right? So, frequency is about organizing your training. The amount of work that you do in a single session can be too much, and I'm going to show you why. The first point I want to make is about learning. A lot of the people who will be a proponent of more volume say that, look, this means you have more chances to practice your skill. You can get stronger this way. Likewise, it's more work for more growth. This is true. However, those of you who are college students, like myself, I've been a college student for a very long time, you know that if you cram right before a test, you might do okay on the test, but you're going to have a tough time remembering everything afterwards. And actual true learning, where you become an expert in a field, requires intense thought uh, and not only a lot of study, but a lot of intelligent study. You have to learn how to learn. And you have to figure out what is the most appropriate dose for you. I found, personally, that cramming was always a terrible idea for me. And that actually spreading apart my learning and reading things and trying things made me a much better student over time. And doing small doses and essentially learning when my brain was ready to, rather than trying to force it when I was burned out. I also learned this playing video games as a young kid, that when I get stuck on a level or I couldn't beat a boss, trying over and over and over again, at a certain point I would just be worse. And if I was simply set the game away, take a few days off and come back, normally I'd fare much better. So, trying to do a whole lot of practice in one cram session of a lot of work may not be as good as spreading it out and getting more chances to practice. However, you could take it too far the other way if you really think about it. If you had six sets to do, and you only did one set per day, you wouldn't really have much chance to make mistakes and correct them. Normally to learn something, you have to do it repeatedly until you can perfect it. However, if you only get one chance to do it, do you really get to perfect it? If you did it wrong, you're done. If you did it right, you don't have much time to reflect or repeat it and, and, and ingrain that. So either way, you can make an argument for learning theory that doing too high or too low a frequency could be inferior. All right? Additionally, it is about recovery. We're not practicing um, sign language here. We're practicing heavy weight training, meaning that we're going to take a beating both psychologically, physically, and emotionally when we are training heavy and hard all the time. So potentially, even doing the same amount of volume but spreading it apart in ways so we can you know, get more nutrition in, sleep, just simply focus on something else, just let our brain kind of doze off and relax, and basically live life, and then put our training in smaller, more manageable blocks over the course of the week may result in better growth. So, this isn't all just theory. And in fact, a large body of evidence suggests that you can do too much in one session, and that if you were to take more uh, training sessions, but take the same amount of volume you previously did and spread them out, that you may actually get faster progress. So check out all five of the references I have below, um, and you can basically see that for lots of reasons, force production, uh, endocrine uh, changes over time, um, just straight up strength in both weightlifters and, and powerlifters, uh, that, that doing too much in one session is a real thing that can happen, and it may make sense to spread it out. Okay? Organization matters. We've harped a lot on the importance of volume and intensity, but how and when you do that volume and intensity is very important. Um, Dr. Mike Zerto, someone I have a great deal of respect for, did his PhD dissertation on this very topic. 
he compared two, uh, two forms of daily undulating periodization. One, the traditional way, where you were to do hypertrophy on the first day, a high volume session, power on the second day, a relatively high intensity but low volume session, and then finally, strength on the third day, where you were doing, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. The traditional approach is hypertrophy, strength, power, where you do moderate uh, intensity, high volume, moderately high, sorry, uh, hypertrophy, strength, sorry, high intensity, moderate volume, and then finally, um, low volume, moderately high intensity. He compared that to his take on it, and this is in powerlifters, of doing hypertrophy first, moving power second, and doing strength last. His argument was that you're going to have a lot of muscle damage and fatigue from that high volume, moderate intensity hypertrophy session, and then trying to perform arguably the most important session for a powerlifter, strength would be compromised. So instead, perform your power session before it, where it's a low amount of volume, a decently heavy but not so heavy load that you may not be able to complete the reps, get your practice in, allow recovery, and then when you're ready, you come in and do that strength session. And he found that statistically significant differences in strength on, I believe, the bench press were found. Um, more volume was able to be accomplished, and there was definitely a trend for the squat to go up as well, and I believe the deadlift, although don't quote me on that, but the point being, organizing the same program in a slightly different way and essentially putting the, the volume and the intensity where it made the most sense to get an overall good plan produced better strength gains uh, and allowed the people to accumulate and perform more volume. So organization matters. You can do too much in a single session. And spreading your, your work over the amount of sessions required to accommodate your volume is a very good approach. Does that mean everyone, no matter what you're doing currently, should do more sessions and spread it, spread it out? No. Most of the time, training anywhere from three to six days per week, like 90% of us do, is perfectly fine. However if, you, if, however, if you have a few sessions where you're just absolutely beat down uh, and you feel that it's actually hurting your progress, you could try spreading it out over more sessions. Um, also, we talked about that curve of your career. Your frequency may need to go up when you're up here because you simply are trying to do enough volume to make yourself adapt. However, it is too much for a single double or three sessions per week and you need to do four, five, six, or maybe even double sessions depending on your sport and whether you're a weightlifter, a powerlifter, or a bodybuilder. Okay? So, for both learning theory and recovery, frequency is an, is an important thing and how you organize your volume and intensity can affect how effective your program is. So organize it in an intelligent way. Finally, we're going to talk about some broad general recommendations for that specifically and bring it all together. All right, so what does this all mean? Well, I'm going to bring it home for you. Whether your goal is strength, hypertrophy, or a blend of the two, I want to give you somewhere to start from. Now, I talked about that Wernbaum uh, 2007 meta-analysis, and I also talked about how the main physiological uh, thing related to strength is your muscle size. However, for strength, specificity is very important. So, using Wernbaum and adjusted for the goal not only for hypertrophy but also for strength, I'm going to give you some guidelines. So, whether you want to get just really, really strong or you want to get big, hypertrophy is important, right? Bigger muscles move bigger weights. So, we want to start with kind of the foundations of making our body grow, and then we need to think about how do I get better at the skill of strength. So, for volume, roughly 40 to 70 reps per body part, okay? If your goal is strength, aim to achieve three-fourths of that volume, or at least half, from the movements that you want to get stronger on, okay? Intensity. 1 to 15 rep max should be the, the ranges you'd probably train in 99% of the time. If your main goal is strength, three-fourths of that should be 6 rep max or lower, and the rest should be higher than that, okay? If your goal is hypertrophy, three-fourths should be in the 6 to 12 rep max range, with the other fourth being above and below it, okay? Frequency. You want to basically train each body part or movement pattern that is the main volume you're getting that, that uh, which is the main movement you're getting that volume through two to three times per week, okay? That means 40 to 70 reps per session, two to three times per week per body part, okay? Now, consider overlap. 
This is very important. If you think about some of the very, very common powerlifting routines like uh, West Side, they will only train squats or deadlift heavy while the other one is light, okay? Because there's so much overlap between these movements. So remember that your body doesn't think of movements as specific to muscle groups. It doesn't think of a lat pull down as only training the lats. In fact, as I talked about in the first session, I believe, the pec, when stretched, can aid in shoulder extension, and so can the tricep. So movements train a lot of things. So when you're doing, if you're thinking about bench for the chest and overhead press for the delts, the reality is they both train delts. When you're thinking about deadlift for the back or squats for the legs, the reality is they both train back and legs, lumbar primarily. So you need to really consider your overlap. So perhaps training deadlifts three times a week and squats three times a week wouldn't be ideal for 99% of you guys. Are there some people who should train that way or can train that way? Certainly, but you also need to think about managing volume intensity and frequency. Maybe you do train squat, bench, and deadlift three times a week when you're very close to a powerlifting competition, but only one of those sessions is actually heavy. The other one might be moderate reps at a moderate volume uh, doing your hypertrophy work, and the other one might be singles and doubles at 80% to train technique so it's not as fatiguing. So it all needs to be considered. But here's a great place to start from. Remember that Wernbaum was primarily based on novice and intermediates. I'm assuming most of you are going to be intermediates watching this, some of you novices, and some advanced. So remember that this might not best represent you if you're on either side of that. My advice is if you're more novice, start with the low end range of the volume. If you're more intermediate or advanced, start with the high end. Start here, give yourself some time, see if you progress. And remember that, that, that kind of flow chart that I provided before about volume. Am I plateaued? If yes, am I recovered? If yes, add more volume. If no, take a light week, deload. If I get better, great, carry on. If I very quickly fatigue again, maybe I need to do less. So figure out if this is appropriate for you and then adjust from there. And remember that over time, you're going to get further and further away from what the general recommendations are and getting a more specific approach. In fact, that's the definition of an advanced athlete. All right? So my friends, Check out the comments below. Lots of citations. I know this is over 30 minutes, but this is probably the most important. Uh, well, it's not the most important. It's the second most important uh, part of the series, but it's probably going to require the most attention. You to watch this a few times, read through it, talk about it, get into debates on Facebook and all that stuff. I'll ignore it all and just keep doing my thing, but you'll learn a whole lot. All right? So, big episode, volume, intensity, and frequency. Next week, we're going to talk about progression. Thank you all.